art imitates life or something like that. And uh, there, then there are just uh, there are a number of short stories concerning um, you know questions of belief versus science. Um, and there, there's a lot of uh, there are a lot of humorous stories as well. For example, one of the stories is called um, "A Call to Arms," and it's the about the life of a civil teenage civil war reenactor in Westport, Connecticut, which is not good. It, it's hard to be a teenage boy, but when your stepdad makes you dress up like a Union soldier uh, every weekend, it's just no way to meet women. <laughs> We have got uh, Terrence Hawkins with us today. He joins us here on the telephone. Uh, so listening to all this, John, do you have any questions for our guest? Um, yeah, I've got two of them. Kind of going a little bit different on the, right, because I'm reading his about part on his website. How hard was it to get into Yale? And, I mean, did, was it a scholarship? Did you Were you just like a super brainiac kid in school that you got in there? Because I find that very interesting. And then um, the second part, I was just going to ask you, I, I find it very good of you because i'm reading here how you become a mentor in visible invisible ink i i like the fact you're helping out with that well i i turning to the second part first um i I really got a lot of help um from other writers while i was coming up and uh i like to think i really wanted to pay it back um i always used to say that um there are two kinds of writers generous and jealous and unfortunately, I'm the latter part, but I sometimes at least try uh, to do for others what others did for me in spades. For example, um, Tom Parada, uh, the guy who wrote uh, The Leftovers, was just incredibly generous with his time uh, reading all of my work. And uh, I, I should also mention the uh, late Richard Seltzer, who was uh, both a practic- practicing surgeon and a very fine writer. Um, about the Yale thing, uh, I got into Yale in the – well, I was in the class in 1978, so I got in in 74. And the world was very different then. Um, I mean, I, you know, I look at the kids who are getting in now, and I think <laughs> obviously they're breeding a master race somewhere because I, that wasn't us. Um, the uh, – I think what helped me a lot is I, I grew up in a coal mining town in western Pennsylvania, and um, Yale at that time was uh, all of the Ivies were making a real push for what they called geographic diversity. I mean, they didn't want every last kid there to be, you know, somebody from Groton or you know Westport or uh, you know Chevy Chase. Um, so that helped, and uh, yeah, I did get a scholarship. Um, though I will also tell you that uh, at that time. A year at Yale costs as much as my, my dad's Chrysler Newport. Um, and because it, when you compare what it costs now, which is about 65 grand, it's, it's obviously the equivalency is no longer there. Um, higher education universally has become incredibly out of reach. And also, just to go back to, that, uh, to the Brainiac point, and believe me, I'm not, um, when I see what high school students now have to go through to have a shot at an IV or equivalent school is, is just crazy. Um, their time is so tightly budgeted. They work so hard. And, you know, according to admissions officers, I, I know the fact that they were, you know, spent the summer of uh, junior year building yurts in Ecuador doesn't make them stand out. You know, I, I just don't get it. But, so that's that's uh, that's that connection. But yeah, I, I really do. The invisible, the visible ink, pardon me, thing is uh, is really valuable to me personally and really fulfilling. The um, the the interesting thing too about visible ink is that it's run through Memorial Sloan Kettering which is an amazing facility uh, in New York. And uh, the person who started the organization is herself a writer whose husband uh, is on staff there. Um, And because it's in New York, um, you know, if I go to a meeting, I'm sitting next to a guy who's who's a 
Tony Award winner. Um, and, and it's also really amazing and, and humbling to see how many people have come through that experience with really remarkably good spirits. I mean, I'd whine and, and cry the whole time, but uh, they don't. <laughs> that's totally awesome. cool that's awesome we have got a, a great guest with us today joins us live here in a broadcast uh terrence hawkins joins us he has got a fantastic new book it is a uh, uh kirkus calls this new book a collection of tales ranges from uh unnerving to exceedingly dark comedy uh it, it is a amazing amazing book and it's a, a follow-up to his first novel the rage of achilles and uh, Terrence is with us today here in our broadcast. You've got a lot of uh, good stuff in your background. Uh, thanks for doing this. By the way, Jay, do you have any any questions for Terrence? Yeah, I'm from one author to another, what was your most difficult um, thing about writing this book? Well, it's, it's interesting you should say that because this is a short story collection, so it's all been previously published, and it covers a pretty broad range of time. So uh, for that reason, you know, I was looking at stuff, uh, and I hesitate to share this fact, but I'm 63 now. I'm looking at stuff I wrote when I was in my late 30s, and I would think, Ugh, you know, what jerk wrote that? Um, because over that passage of time, a lot of attitudes have changed. Uh, and a lot of things that were, you know, uh, acceptably uh, laddish in the 90s don't land quite as well these days. Um, and then also uh, from, the, from the writerly craft point of view, when you're looking at a story that was written in 1995, you have to decide whether you want to try to bring it into the, you know, the end of the first quarter of the 21st century, which is where we are now, or whether you want to leave it in the 90s. Um, and in some of the stories, it was comparatively easy to update it without doing violence to the whole story. For example, in the, the Westport Civil War reenactor story I mentioned, um, uh, I changed um, an iPod to an iPhone because nobody has iPods anymore. Uh, and he was listening to Billie Eilish rather than Hoobastank. Um, so that was easy. But in another story, um, one of the characters is a newspaper reporter, and he says, I don't have a cell phone. But that's almost inconceivable by present standards. But I decided in that case that if I tried to move the story into the present, I would just do damage to so many other parts of the plot that I'd just leave it where it was. So, um, yeah, and, and I, I will say, too, the, uh, uh, I'm used to editing people. Um, this is the first time I've been edited in a, a, a very consistent way. And um, it, that was an interesting experience, too, because um, not since I was going to writing workshops 30 years ago did I, did I get critiqued quite the same way. Now, of course, I just have to read reviews on Amazon or wherever, which can be equally brutal, but in a different way. Fantastic. So, uh, Terrence, what are some of your goals for this book? Well, I, I think, you know, the objective, well, the objective for me personally, of course, was to make sure that these stories were put together in some kind of cohesive fashion that people uh, could enjoy. But if if I had any uh, single objective for how I wanted these things to land with the reader, it would be that they question their certainties. Um, that's what one of the stories in particular that I almost made the title story, The Darkness at, at the Center of Everything, is um, set in two timelines. One is ancient Sumeria, where a couple of temple priests are discovering astronomy. And the other is present-day Connecticut, where the Earth has inexplicably stopped turning. So um, we have two timelines, one of which the, the priests, of course, have no question that the sun is actually a god that's arising every morning from the distant ocean. And the people in Connecticut, 
Connecticut, of course, know that it's a star 92 million miles away. And it's about how people react when their certainties have suddenly evaporated, which is not too, too different from where we are now, is it? Because um, the world is sure a lot different May 10th, uh, 2020, than it was uh, January 10th. Yes. Very much so. Uh, well, Terrence, before we let you go, how do we find you uh, online, websites, get the book, everything? Um, for uh, To get the book, of course, it's available on Amazon. And also there's a new organization that's been out for uh, just about a month now that's doing extremely well called bookshop.org. It's uh, basically kind of a consortium of independent bookstores. Um, wow. And the, yeah, the sale price, uh, part of the sale price goes to a general fund that's paid out both to the author and to independent bookstores. So if uh, you want those things to still be around when this is all over, um, I would strongly su suggest going to bookshop.org. Um, otherwise, you can find me uh, at terrence-hawkins.com one R in Terrence, as I always say. Um, and of course I'm, I'm available on Facebook and, um, uh, I'm, uh, on Twitter at Yale writers and Instagram at Terrence Hawkins.